news for faculty for the last few years, and I'm super honored to be presenting you this morning. And I don't think they can see me up there, but um, I want to welcome. You have quite a crew of guests online here, um, but specifically Anders committee members, Dr. Dela Cruz Williams and Dr. Lee Jenkins. So um, wow, it has just been such an absolute pleasure working with this very intense young person who is simply wise beyond his years. Um, he's done an exceptional job and some groundbreaking work in uh, collecting and analyzing his data. He has done an equally exceptional job in, in presenting the resulting creative design of curricula based on living systems. Um, but it's that voice, that voice <laughs> of a wise and caring and grounded teacher uh, that brings such heart to this work. And so I'm just really happy to present um, Andrew Bernier. Well, thank you all so much uh, for coming today. And, you know, it's been an, uh, a real honor and pleasure to be part of this curriculum or this program. And basically what came out of it was a, a curriculum that I invented, and part of this was by accident, and part of this was due to experience. Um, but um, when, I, when I first started getting into sustainability, uh, there was a quote that got to me, and I know this quote got to a lot of people, uh, it's that we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created by Albert Einstein. This quote has been abused, it's been overused in the sustainability field, it's on probably half the people's bottom email signature, including my own, that I've seen. Um, so, uh, but when I first was introduced to this concept, I was like, that, that was what clicked with me at first. When I was really getting introduced to envir my environmental studies major and getting introduced to the very depressing problems of the world, it was like, well, we, what if we just thought differently? What if we just did things differently? And so it's been amazing to see people get absorbed in stuff, but I wanted to see how we can change people's way of thinking. And so I want to show you what I've been doing for the last four years. Audio on? The sustainability program at Crest is the first of its kind in the country. For the first time ever, a public high school student will be getting class devoted to sustainability every single day of their high school career. And we are home growing it right here at Crest. It's a unique and original and innovative program that combines a wide variety of instructional methods, hands-on learning, high theory and high complex thinking systems, the multimedia creation, and making sure that we, the practices our students take on, are preparing them for what's happening right now and happening in the future at both the college and industry levels. In the Crest Sustainability Program, uh, in our student-led labs, we, or, we research mainly how organisms interact with each other and how they interact with their environment. So we'll be studying uh, biology and chemistry between organisms and how they work themselves and how they depend on their environment. And also how we impact that and how that system going on in itself impacts our human society. Sustainability allows me to think. I mean about ideas that matter and it gives me the awareness of what's going on in our world and it allows me to participate in engineering, biotechnology, and learn about different things such as biology and other forms of labs. What makes the Crest Sustainability Program is that it's the first time that public high school students are being posed with the challenge, what do you want your future to look like and what are you gonna do about it? We need people to be systems thinkers and to be core evaluators of how we live on this planet how we exercise resource materials, how we make sure we have clean water and clean food, and how are we going to make sure that the quality of life is good enough for the coming 12 billion people that will be living on this planet. Because of all the challenges that we get to face uh, in sustainability, it's preparing me to think differently about all these challenges, and it's preparing me to help the other people in our generation to come up with solutions to fix these issues. Crest has inspired me to do things that most students wouldn't ever think of. It's inspired me to go participate in outside events outside of our school. It's inspired me to do better in class because I know that by learning about AP biology and what cells mitosis is, that I'm going to learn and use that in what my job field is going to be. Sustainability isn't something that you can learn straight from a textbook. It isn't a solution that's stated plainly in the text. It's you piecing together different people and different pieces and different knowledge so that you as a person can make the best decision. And it's all on you to make that right decision, to make sure that everybody is happy and everybody is healthy. All right, cool. 
uh, you may have told, I totally forgot we were filming on that day, so it was a little groggy. Uh, but um, I wanted to get into the fact that um, this, that, that was an amazing thing. It's a very unique experience, which gave rise to this dissertation. Um, but the traditional part of education was what really got me going. And since this is what education really has looked like and has been more or less for the last century, this idea of the traditional, traditional industrial education model. Uh, this was a very intentional design to produce factory workers. And this concept is over a century old. Uh, you may have heard of three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And it's more or less that came from the ability for students to then be able to do calculations, to write reports, and to follow directions mostly. Now, while education looks drastically different, it still follows that very same concept of introduction of a concept or skill, teaching and learning process, um, and then the students will produce a desired output, uh, and then the teacher provides feedback, and then we're back to the beginning again of introduction of concept and skill. So ironically, it kind of follows that of a conveyor belt model. It's just, can, let's keep producing and cranking out work for the sake of learning. Um, and so this past summer, I actually was in Japan for an education for sustainability trip. And when I got there, take a quick look at this picture and now look at this one. And it was the kind of the exact same thing. It was just instruction, it was that back and forth. There was a lot of talk about sustainability, but it was still very much following that same picture taken over a century ago. Um, so my guiding questions throughout this research, and you'll be seeing images of the students uh, doing work throughout this presentation, is how do systems uh, differ from linear? So obviously linear is the opposite construct of systems thinking. Um, how can I possibly get, and will students uh, voluntarily shift their uh, focus from individual concepts and assignments to looking at the relationships between concepts? And if they are able to do that, how do you actually measure that? Um, and since most of this, it will hopefully be absorbed into the public school spectrum, uh, how can traditional grades be incorporated into that measurement? And if they are able to, can we actually design something that can give a physical manifestation of uh, that understanding, that measurement? And of course, being sustainability, looking at natural concepts and natural systems, can, is there something in nature that can lend itself to uh, this model? And being a 21st century skill, and since I just really enjoy the concept of communication, uh, can, what role does communication play in developing a systems curriculum? <clears throat> uh, all my students were AP and honor students, and so I wanna make sure we maintain a level of uh, rigor, rigor, but at the same time, if my students are miserable, that's gonna make me miserable, and I don't want this to go any further. So how can I make it rigorous, but both enjoyable? The biggest question is, is this even a viable option? Will this thing even work? So that's what this dissertation's been all about, this is to measure if, if that possibility. Here's my literature review. <laughs> I saw people have a jolt reaction there. Trust me, uh, it's been that process too. Uh, I'll go through this quickly, I don't wanna focus too long, but basically the first thing I wanna do is break down linear between systems. And so when I was looking at linear constructs, you might see some familiar faces here. Uh, uh, Edward Deming, looking at efficiency rates, Dewey, of course, uh, Ackoff and Greenberg, for those of you who, uh, hopefully this is still being assigned, turning learning right side up in our first year, was a very influential to my uh, take on this. Um, one thing I really want to look at here was educational waste. And so this process here of a linear construct, let's take a step back and look at um, high throughput economy. And so looking at high material production, creation of waste, production, consumption, and disposal, that's a very linear construct and it's a highly inefficient, wasteful construct. Education is no different in a linear construct, but you have wasted time, you have wasted talent, you have wasted resources. When you plunk a kid in a chair, and you just barrage him, with, or him or her with information, so much of that is not gonna be absorbed. Um, and then looking at critical pedagogy, and a lot of this uh, was fascinating work, uh, looking at uh, Freire and Scholl and Giroux uh, and Apple and Chomsky also was an incredible read, co contribution to this as well. But looking at how education as a construct has been now designed as an oppression for a lot of different social classes how a lot of it was made as a white construct, predominantly upper class as well, and it has been made to more or less keep classes of students who are from in their family lineage in particular classes as well. So it actually has been, seen, has been argued as a form of oppression, a linear construct. And so going back to the uh, T chart here, I found that linear is uh, rigid, is very prone to disruption when you have a singular path. If something were to happen to that, that path can be easily broken. 
Uh, it it uh, requires a top-down power construct, which is typically teacher to student. Uh, singular path and load capacity. Um, for those of you who are, you know, for instance, interested in electrical wiring, if you overload a particular circuit with too much information, you'll fry that circuit and it's gone. Um, and if you have no other possible routes to go to, um, you can exhaust that singular path. Uh, and as we uh, referred to before, waste and in education. So they wanted to get into systems. And so there might be some folks here that you are familiar with. Senge, uh, Peter Senge was massive uh, influence on mine. Uh, David Orr, um, Orr had a major presence as well. Uh, Fritjof Capra and Donella Meadows also heavily influenced my work as well. And looking at leverage points, hidden connections, uh, the intent of design, uh, William McDonough's work was very inspirational to uh, this idea of how is that we approach design. And then I started really getting into the idea of biomimicry. So using nature as a model. So having to, as opposed to inventing our own construct and design models, let's use what nature's been working on for 3.8 billion years. She's tested it a lot and it's worked for most. <laughs> Um, and so uh, that can brings us back. So opposite of rigidity, you have flexibility, diversity, adaptivity, and resilience. You have mutual input. So looking as opposed to a DC of an AC current, where it can go both way between learner and teacher. Uh, multiple paths and least resistance. So giving a student multiple options in which competencies to choose from, uh, and the student can then choose something that they find the most able to understand at that point in time. Imagine trying to teach a concept to a child at the beginning of class that they don't understand, yet they might have, have an easier time understanding a concept towards the end of that class. But if they can't get over that initial concept up front, they're never gonna get that. And that's where you get lots of high, uh, high dropout rates, when students feel failure up front. And if you only give them one path in which to follow, that's where, unless, you know, unless you give them multiple paths, that's where you're gonna see that failure rate high at the beginning. And the last one is elimination of waste. Uh, so again, William McDonald's concepts of no waste in nature, uh, waste equal food, and cradle to cradle design. And just to brag, here's my students with William McDonough. That was an awesome day. Uh, um, really cool. It's also the mayor of Phoenix uh, right over there who's been a champion of sustainability in what has been called the, most, the least sustainable city on the planet. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep going because I know my time's a little low. Here's kind of the what of sustainability. You'll see Stone and Barlow from the Center for Ecological Literacy. You got Loven there. Um, or is uh, contributing once again. Stephen Sterling runs rampant. Um, and then this one I want to really focus on. Media technology communication drive 21st century, uh, century uh, sustainable education. Uh, looking at a lot of 21st century skill sets, they, they sound a lot like 20th century skill sets. But what I was reading is that digital media literacy was the one that has really emerged into these new uh, standards. Okay, so uh, looking at this thing, I'm going to take Orr, who is really popular. And I noticed these systems emerging from the author. So for instance, here's all the times that Orr has been uh, referenced in my literature review. And I just noticed that the authors were kind of saying somewhat of the same thing bridging together networks. And so if I take, here's Orr by himself, if I did this for all the authors, here's what emerged from all the different uh, authors in my literature review. So here's all the times that they made these common connections um, in, in, the re, in the literature review. Okay, cool. Um, so if I'm gonna cruise through this, but students uh, cohort 10 and nine, if you are not surrounded by whiteboards at all time, uh, you need to change that because you have no idea when awesome ideas will start emerging. Here's what the actual content started emerging. And here was some of the great content. And this was in my classroom. So some of my students who are here today had to be surrounded by this at all times. So they knew exactly what I was prepping them for and what my madness was starting to look like. Um, so I did three sets of data. I only had 13 students in which to work with on this research. So I had to like plunk and get as much data out of them. So I did three different, say, a triangulated data. And the first one was grades. And so on that whiteboard, you may have seen the beginning construct, but what I did is I designed what's known as a dichotomous rubric. And so in this rubric, uh, it gives weight as you move from left to right. The first one was still, did you get all your work done? I mean, you got you to gotta do the work. Uh, the second one was how well they actually explain the competency in class. So these students would then meet with me and we would discuss how <sighs> they're understanding. And in this process over here, does the student accurately and clearly explain the concept? Did they use correct terminology? Did they articulate with speech and concept? Did they use clear and conscious responses to questions? Uh, we'll move on. Uh, if you'll notice up at the top or at the top of each category, uh, if they got three, five or three or five or four of each one of them, that would be a yes or a maybe or somewhat or a no. And that would then flow to then a numerical value of the grade of the competency in which they were being assessed on. 
And the last one over there, uh, you'll notice that content and theoretical competencies, competencies were focused on the relationships to other competencies. And the other two research and application competencies uh, were uh, determined by two other aspects. And so I'm actually going to hand out a sheet here, which I encourage you to hang on to because there's an activity in the back of it. Uh, but here's the actual list of all the competencies in which we worked on in the curriculum. That is not a definitive list. That was adopted by, I think, seven or eight different competencies lists as well. Uh, I imagine that most of you will find objection or absence of some ideas. It is by no means a definitive list, and I intend to adjust that uh, plenty in the future. So anyway, here's, uh, here's a timeline. I'll go over it quickly. So students were, they got to choose which competencies they were ready for. So giving them the options to understand, well, this is what I understand. Here's what I'll go for. But this was the timeline and expectation of when, what, how many of what competencies they got to choose throughout their four years in high school. So here are the grades. Um, the blue lines were the grades that were assessed solely by the rubric, and the red grades were the ones that were all of the grades. So not all of the grades were assessed by the rubric. There were some that were kind of more traditional graded. And so you can tell uh, students that uh, tended to do well, you know, it, it follows traditional uh, trends. And so students who graded well did well, but I want you to notice here on the blue and red, for instance, these students, here were their regular grades, and here's the grades by the rubric. Look at the grade bump on some of the students that were able to have greater choice in the curriculum model. So they were able to increase their grade when they were given options and flexibility of what they were ready to be uh, assessed on. And then students that traditionally did well, I mean, they, they did well anyway. It, typically, a lot of it was um, some missing grade work and them not understanding some of the content when I introduced it. But they were able to go back and justify their understanding for other content when they were ready. Uh, the rubric that, that um, before I forgot to mention, that was a negotiation process. That's one of the things I wanted the students to learn was how to negotiate grades. I mean, you go to a marketplace or a marketplace in a job place, uh, you negotiate your salary. Why don't I have that construct in terms of negotiating grades as well? And I noticed that students who were willing to uh, negotiate higher grades got higher grades. So I found out, and this was not an intentional design, that this curriculum tends to reward students that have a little bit of moxie in them in terms of, hey, I want to I bump up the grade. And if they could justify it and they had the assignment evidence for it, why not? Uh, similar scores followed a similar path. Uh, and this was a really interesting here. Uh, there's uh, application content competencies in that sheet that just came out. I totally allowed students to pull in their experiences from volunteer work, from uh, extracurriculars, from other things they were doing. So every, it wasn't just my assignments that I was assessing on. I allowed them to introduce other elements of their life to justify their understanding. And so application was a lot of skill sets I was looking at. And so students pulled in those things, and that's what happened to have the highest grades. So here are the average grades here. An application came up to be the highest because they weren't limited to just what was introduced in class. <clears throat> uh, the second data set, which complements the first one, is uh, student competency. So I had uh, meetings with all these students, and this one's going to be intense. And so they came in and they're like, "Hey, Mr. Bernier, I want to go for uh, was it SMT uh, four? If you look in the sheet, I believe SMT four is transportation." So after I introduced transportation concepts, it was up to the student to come on and be like, okay, I'm ready to go for a grade for this. I'm like, awesome. Okay, so I'm um, just using that as an example. So here's the scatter plot. So a student would come in, so they would say, Mr. Bernier, I wanna get a grade in transportation. Awesome. So what I did is that I recorded all of the meetings I had with the students, and then the competencies are also listed up there. So every time that a student mentioned another competency within that grade, say for transportation, I marked it as a hit on the scatter plot. And so what was interesting, I'm gonna try and zoom in here. Um, zooming out, zooming in. Can you guys see transportation yet? Can you see that there, is that clear? Yeah. Cool, okay, so here's transportation. So here's every time that a student mentioned another competency within transportation. And so, for instance, looking at here in this box, so these are all the comp other, every time the sustainable materials technology and the sustainable materials technology, I had 38 hits and other mentions. And this one here, had seven hits. So if I go up, this was SMT8, which I believe was urban design. 
So that tells me students made incredibly strong relationship connection between transportation and urban design. That tells me in my, my teaching and whatever the material, that was a very strong connection that students made. That, that shows me that relationship understanding. Whereas if I look at the box next to it, which has no hits, um, SMT seven, which one is that one? Waste management. Okay, so transportation waste management. I, there's no, students haven't made that connection. So this gives me a guide to follow of where st students are making. So this is seven students made this connection is what's saying here. You know, the, the vast majority were just one student making the connection. Uh, I'm going to keep moving. Uh, let's see. So they tended to favor comp, uh, like category competencies. So they tended to clump together. <clears throat> uh, I noticed that they were a lot better in materials and technology than they were with energy. So as a teacher that tells me that I taught uh, materials, and materials and technology really well, and I didn't do as well in sustainable energy, which was the other class I was teaching. So for me, that's feedback that, okay, there are some connections that are missing. So that's, that's a relationship understanding that has produced a visual model. Um, here's the grades here, that's energy and materials technology, and uh, there's, you can see the difference in grades, but look at here, the connections. 50 total connections were made in energy, 123. That came, comes out to, for each content competency in energy, only 8.33 connections were made, whereas 15.38 connections were made. That, that heightened level of relationship connectivity within the student's understanding shows me, I did a really good job, kids were really moving with, this, with the content and sincere, materials and technology, and I have to go back and revisit my energy course. And so that, that tells me a lot of feedback information. Um, and I love this part. They referenced the two classes I taught prior, which were sustainable ecosystems and sustainable water and food. And this just gets back to the idea of, of waste. Why not be able to go back to prior classes and use that as justification for understanding? And so they were readily going back into their sophomore course, those were juniors at the time, and using that to justify the other understanding for current content. That was beautiful stuff. I mean, when the kids leave, they're gonna have a complete comprehensive four-year education that overlaps with each other and making connections throughout four-year experience as opposed to living in those silos of traditional uh, liberal arts. Uh, very little connection of, uh, of theoretical to research. So it's kind of this black hole of connectivity up here. So, so. But I noticed that that was not uh, measured on the rubric. I didn't design the dichotomous rubric that way. And that's a design flaw on my part. So that's something I would go back to the rubric and tweak to put more emphasis on connectivity to those two other content competencies, uh, those, con those connections. Um, and theoretical was the strongest, hence why it's blue. Um, I used a... Uh, Roy G. Biv construct in Roy G. Biv, the color spectrum. Basically, if it's red, very low. Once we get into the green, blue, indigo, violet, that's when the higher hyper connectivity starts to happen. Okay, um, my time is running out. So I did 66 meetings with them. I only coded 44 because transcribing is expensive. Um, <laughs> forewarning future cohorts. Um, um, but I got two, at least two from each student. Um, and so of the 44 I did, there was 110 competencies attempted, uh, 457 distinct uh, connections were made. Uh, I'm just gonna go through this data chart. Basically what happened is that the students who scored higher, the highest over 90%, they had a, a tendency for 5.8 to 4.5 connections per competency, whereas the average is 3.88. And here is basically the, the compare, this is more or less the visual of the chart. Uh, here's the, the oranges, how many connections they made per competency, and there's a, a comparison to the grade. But what I did find interesting is that even though high meant high, low did not mean low, which was awesome. Uh, students who had lower grades still had a tendency to go mid to high level in terms of how many connections they were able to make. So I just, I was really nice to see that because if a student was able not had low, if they had low grades, it didn't mean they were making low connectivity. So that was a really encouraging aspect. Um, so data set three. So this is kind of the whole, did you feel good during the process? And so what we did is we did semester long blogging and, uh, one blog per week for 16 weeks. And so this is how we measured it. Uh, the color spectrum still follows uh, the Roy, uh, Roy G. Biv. So if it's red, they only made one academic connection. If it's orange, uh, and yellow it goes up. Uh, so what I did was, I'm going to just kind of cruise through here. <clears throat> I weighted each blog post as the semester went along. 
So for instance, the, you'll notice there's numbers in here. So here's a one. This was the first blog of the semester for that student. Here's the 13th week. And what I did is I tallied up the totals in each quadrant. Each quadrant means a different concept. And I had the students do a self-assessment on these quadrants uh, in terms of what their blogs were all about. This was a positive internal and a outward perspective. So basically, did you feel good and was it a perspective on the world? Quadrant two was, did you feel good and was it a more internal reflection? Down here, negative, did you feel bad and was it kind of more reflected inwards? Or is this one, did you feel bad and is this like a pessimistic view about the world? And they were able to use kind of a Likert, I use Likert scales for them to measure where those blog posts located. Um, and so here are three examples of some. I love how this one stayed mostly in the positive range and kind of ping pong back forth from internal to external. Uh, let's see. So um, I looked at, uh, this, is, this one shocked me. Um, so for the four of the five students who had the highest grades, students four, nine, 10, 12, and 13, kids who had high grades, didn't care to make high academic inclusion in their, so I also counted the academic inclusion in the blogs. High grades did not mean high academic inclusion. But here's what's fascinating. Students who had the lowest grades, four to five, they had the highest amount of academic content inclusion in their blogs. So I didn't ask that as a grade. I think it was fascinating that kids, this is all volunteer blogging. They wrote about whatever they want. So make it about sustainability or Crest, which was the name of the school. And kids that had low academic grades when they were voluntarily writing about anything they wanted, that's where I found a lot of academic richness in their elective writing. And too bad it wasn't grading for academic content. But that was a fascinating turnaround. And, kids, and the kids that knew that that was how the grade structure went, they were like, I'm not going to bother including. I'm just going to write how I feel, whatever. Blog's done. Mr. Burner's happy. So that's kind of how that went. Um, Cool. All right. So um, I really thought academic and content uh, would increase over time. That didn't happen. Uh, so that's remained relatively flat. Um, here's and here's a really interesting thing. So I actually added up all the academic content within the blog post. The academic content was like vocabulary terms, assignments referenced, and competencies mentioned. Uh, quadrants two, three, and four were more or less the same. But if you notice, the yellow line here is kind of the same there. It turned into green line, which uh, meant six or seven items. So there was more academic content included in blog posts that were more positive and external in nature. So when basically what that means is that when kids are having a good view about the world around them, they tended to include more academic content, which was a really cool, uh, really cool insight. Okay, um, this one will go pretty quick. And so... Quadrant, I wanted to see what quadrant majorities there were. Um, quadrants one and two, which were both positive, but positive one was uh, external, two was internal. Uh, had a balance, six each. One student didn't feel very good on the inside. That made me feel sad. Um, but what I noticed is that I tallied up the numbers. And so that's quadrant uh, one, positive external in nature of the blog post. This is a positive internal. <laughs> So what I saw was a very slight preference to feeling good on the inside in their elective writing. And if you look at systems curriculum, especially for like molecular models, the concept of homeostasis, of trying to maintain balance in the internal environment, I'm reflecting this onto this because there's a balance of a kid wanting to feel good on the perspectives of sustainability on how they feel and also the viewpoints on the world around them. So I thought that was a really cool uh, find. That one I did not expect to see. When I was reading the blog post, it was, seemed like it was sad all the time. So I'm glad that student perceptions were different. Okay, so I've got, oh man, low on time. So this is what I originally proposed way back when, uh, last year. And I thought, oh, this is cool. And then so I put it together, and this is uh, the a median student, low student, and high student. And the model didn't really quite work. I'm going to kind of bruise through here. So overall grade 84. Here were the connections. So this, she went for... Uh, Theoretical concept 14, which is just transitions. Those are the connections she made and there's the grade itself. Sorry, I'm about to fly here a little bit. Here is um, a low connections. Only two connections made to transportation, score of a 6.8 on that dichotomous rubric. And then you look at the richness of this molecule here, of how many times they were able to meet and score. And I look at, I look at this one here, which is waste management. I'm gonna let, you, let her do the talking. Another type of diverting waste that you could do that we touched touched on in waste of water and food is composting. So you can take the green waste or the organic materials that aren't man-made from your um, 
your trash, I guess. And you can reuse them and recycle them into a fertilizer. And so you could hear the mentions of uh, food waste and composting within the construct of waste management. And I would love to... Whether the resident wants to or not, they are going to recycle. Because everything that goes in goes through these um, separators and they filter out aluminum and paper and plastic and glass. And um, they separate that out just like we, we saw at the MRF here and bail it and sell it overseas. Okay, so I got two more, but I'm going to fortunately keep the drainage going. from the waste. That, oh, that was a good one, too. Okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, from the data, I found out that model is not complete. And I actually had to dig further into how biology wants to work. And this is getting into the idea of biomimicry. And so what I did was as opposed to waiting for the student to pick and choose competencies, I wanted to make all of them available except for the content because I'm introducing the content on a linear timeline based on my instruction. But what I want to do is I want to introduce now an evolution into the cellular model. So I want to go from the molecular, when you put a bunch of molecules together, they tend to form a cell and then you get the tissue. So um, I'm, you're going to have to imagine this as a full sphere. This is a bit of a cross section. So this is the new model that I'm uh, proposing and this is what's on the back. So imagine that this is a complete sphere with all the application, research, and theoretical competencies already present as a sphere. Think about it as like a cell membrane. Imagine the student has now come in and we've gone over some content and this is what starts to emerge. And so one of the complaints I had with the old model is that I didn't give any way to justify the strength of the relationships. It was just like, oh, you mentioned it. In chemistry, there's single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. I would imagine a single bond is relatively weak, a double bond, which is a little closer in structure, and two bonds a little stronger, and then triple bonds are very short, but they're a lot stronger. And one thing I thought would be really interesting to apply to this is the concept of the three E's, or the triple bottom line sustainability, which a lot of introductory students in sustainability tend to grasp onto. So what if between um, SEN's Sustainable Energy 6 and Sustainable Energy 3, if they're able to provide me the ecological, economical, and equity, social justification, that tells me they have a phenomenal understanding between these two constructs. And then they can start to bridge to the cell membrane. So as kind of like a protein here, as the content starts to form and then starts to bend as, I mean, because that old, that linear one, that's not really how molecules look. This is how molecules actually look and getting into the idea of hydrophobia and hydrophilia, you can tell maybe they're starting to be more attracted to this part of the cell membrane, and that tells me uh, they're not, something's not happening with the students with maybe the content that's on this side of the cell membrane. And it helps to form and bolt. So imagine now, over time, content has been taught, and over the semester, this is what the actual construct of a, syst of a student's systems thinking looks like. What if we actually were able to de design 3D models that a student can build over their course of education that you can take? Imagine now like a, phys a sphere, like, look, this is how I think. You can see the connections. How cool is that? We're, we're no longer, we're no longer looking at just scores, uh, test scores and data sheets. We're using cell, this exists in nature. I'm, I didn't invent anything, by the way. I'm borrowing ideas that are all, that make up billions of you. This exists in you, except these are ideas. I just swapped atoms with competencies. So uh, complications, I'm gonna cruise to these. So unique circumstances, um, you know, this was CTE, Career and Technical Education, so I had a ton of resources at my disposal. Uh, I had the students for three and four years, which is a, a, a blessing that most teachers don't have. Um, totally dependent on significant background and uh, knowledge on the instructor's part. So this requires a lot of training for educators um, and the sustainability of sustainability program. And it's really sad to say that this program it had, was closed upon because of low enrollment. So you know, it still was prey to the constructs of public education. Um, Two arguments against the cell model. The linear model works very efficient, and especially in the light of budget cuts, increased class sizes, closure of programs, increased standards, you're gonna be blowing up classroom sizes. I don't know how a web systems construct can work in classes of 30 or 40 kids. Um, but I do wanna argue one thing, that even overloaded conveyor belts will break. 
Uh, digital reliance. I did a lot of media technology. I find it very ironic that I handed out worksheets. I never handed out worksheets. <laughs> and it was all, but I didn't have laptops, so ironic. It was irony. But uh, one thing that Lowe, uh, Richard Lowe introduced is the idea of the techno naturalist that we can use technology as an instrument, a tempered instrument, to bring kids back into nature. Uh, next steps for the systems curriculum. Um, I got a. It was already aligned to, to Common Core standards, but I got to clean it up a lot more significantly. Um, I need to. I want to branch it out to other different testing environments, educational environments like community college, get an elementary. Just see. I mean, I had 13 high functioning high school kids, so I got to see where else it can roll. Um, and then, how would you package it and organize it for instructors and school districts to absorb and implement? So that's something I would need to clean up. I have just pages of units and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> And so final considerations, this is a viable model. It was awesome, the kids loved it. Um, and it, this was big for me, that it helped students who fell behind in linear systems. Um, I thought this picture was so cool. I told a kid, look, I need you to go systems diagram me something. I was like, okay, and ran, got an expo marker and did that on one of our glass walls. So really cool, I mean, it's a, this is not a weird way of thinking, this already is there. Um, you know, I see this research, uh, contributing to the convergence of three major fields, systems theory, curriculum design, and sustainability ed. Um, it offers not only evidence, but it offers a tool. I'm trying to give the field something that people can work with. Um, broken down to its simplest elements and magnified for entire ecosystems, we find the interconnected web of life supported by relationships and that no living thing can exist in isolation. Our students and how they learn are no different. And uh, I wanted to include the, the number 3.8, going back to the biomimicry. This stuff already exists. It's been tested and tested and has produced all of you. It produced the living world. It's, I'm just borrowing the idea. And so it works. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much to my committee. Uh, so many people, the Crest Assembly students, some of who are in attendance, uh, my family, my girlfriend and partner. And Sam, thank you so much. Um, Linda Coyle has been a champion. My friends who are still there who want to hang out after this, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> the school district uh, for letting me do this, uh, my mentors over time, the faculty so much uh, for your guidance. Um, Julie Horwin was a mentor who was like, hey, this is, this is a dissertation. Oh, that sounds cool. And then this happened. Um, the library uh, staff, tech staff, thank you so much for your help. Uh, my work for giving me time to do this and all the cohorts for your support and cohort seven, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> They pick and choose, so not a timeline. So they got to choose. So I pasted it out over time. Yes, there were certain, like four comp, like four research or six content. All the content had to be hit upon in that semester, but the research, the theoreticals, and the applications, I saw those as kind of all over the place for sustainability. So if a kid really wants to talk about one aspect of sustainability, but that's another kid is not ready, they got the option to choose in between. Okay, um, and then you said that the meeting wasn't necessarily part of your rubric. Were they aware that you were studying their connections? Um, when they, when you were talking to you? Um, no, the students knew. They, on the rubric, I was like, make sure you're talking about other things. I was like, I want to hear you mention other competencies, and that's going to determine the score. I want to throw it to anyone who's in the cyber world. Is there anyone there? Anything? <laughs> what? I think we got maybe one, one more. Yeah. Makes me think of adult basic education. Okay. How people who aren't doing well will go to a specialized classroom and just work on things independently. Did you do any work to look at ABE? 
your model and seeing how they So I just started teaching at a community college, sustainability. So that's kind of where I mentioned where I want the next horizons to go is how will this start and will this even fly with other age groups or other alternative types of learners? This is fantastic. All right. Thank you so much. Woo! <laughs>